Hello, my name is Daniel Perez, and uh, today I am going to present you smart contract vulnerabilities. Vulnerable does not imply exploited. Uh, this is a joint work uh, with Benjamin Levschitz. And uh, so first, um, just to get everyone up to speed, a very small um, background about uh, Ethereum smart contracts. Um, so Ethereum smart contracts are basically uh, small programs that are deployed on the Ethereum blockchain. They are typically written in a high-level programming language, uh, typically Solidity. Uh, which is the uh, most used one. And they're compiled down into um, bytecode uh, designed to run on the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, which we call the EVM. And this is really a simple um, stack-based bytecode with uh, regular uh, instructions, such as add, sub, um, these arithmetics, and also um, some more uh, blockchain-related type of instructions, uh, such as, for example, call, which allows a contract to call into another smart contract. And so how this work is that um, once a user compiles his code down to this EVM bytecode, he can send a transaction uh, containing his bytecode. This will be deployed uh, to a new address on chain. And then other users can interact with this program by sending transactions to this particular address. And so, well, these are great, and uh, they allow to do a lot of things, but obviously there, um, can, there are a lot of problems, uh, security problems that come with these. And these are now a bit old, but there are like fairly big hacks that happened in the early days of all these smart contracts. And so the DAO hack was um, one of the most important ones, even up to this day, uh, where an attacker um, sold, uh, stole roughly 15 million uh, dollars worth of uh, money. And at this point, uh, the price of ETH halved, and there was a um, whole um, debacle in the Ethereum community. And this was used, um, this was uh, exploited using a fairly well known um, vulnerability that's called reinforcing. And uh, one year later, there was also, I mean, there has been a couple others too, but another very big um, hack or rather bugs and hack for this one where uh, a wallet which was designed as a library on which uh, many contracts um, relied upon uh, has, has been uh, removed uh, from the blockchain due to a bug. So the, the contract was just not there anymore and all dependent contracts became completely unable to uh, move their funds, which froze uh, roughly at this day, at this point in time, uh, $280 million worth of funds, um, which, which are still uh, frozen right now and locked uh, up to this day. And so, um, well, the, both of these uh, relied on some known vulnerabilities. And here we will, in this paper, we focused on a, a couple of these uh, fairly well-known ones. So I will just briefly introduce each of them. So reentrancy um, is basically a contract that are uh, not really designed to be uh, executed in a, in a reentrant way. And uh, because, for example, their state uh, tracking balances resourcing might not be updated properly, uh, if it's uh, called in a reinforced manner, uh, you, an attacker can use this to raise funds. And then we have unheld exceptions where um, a contract might not check properly whether a call he made was uh, successful or not, and this can result in funds uh, lost, being lost or stolen. Um, then the one we just saw is the parity wallet bugs. That's the dependency on this contract where the fund can uh, end up being completely locked because there is no way to, to move them except by relying on this contract, which does not exist anymore. Then there is transaction or dependency. So this is a problem where uh, reordering some transactions might um, ca cause the outcome to be different. And it might allow some attacker to manipulate prices, for example, or to front running or this sort of things. Uh, then integer overflow happens quite often uh, in this uh, Ethereum context, uh, simply because these are not checked by the VM, and this can go uh, silently, go through silently, and result in different problems depending on how, what, what exactly happened. And finally, unrestricted actions. This is more like a permission problem where an attacker might be able to, to, to steal funds or like to, for example, destroy a contract without being explicitly uh, allowed to. So to prevent all these bugs um, and to, to help developers build a safer contracts, a lot of tools have been developed. 
Uh, and this is, for example, a um, tool called Securify, which has been developed, I think, two, three years ago or so, um, and which checks for most of these uh, known patterns. I think almost all of the ones I presented in the previous slide. And they have also this very nice UI where they can tell someone, for example, here that um, this kill function is not safe because anybody can call it and it would disrupt the contract. Um, and also send the funds to the user calling this. And obviously this is a bit of a trivial example, but um, it allows developers to, to, to check for all these uh, potential issues and to fix them before um, it becomes a real problem. So um, when we first started, work started working on this paper, we saw that there were a lot of tools analyzing all these contracts. Um, and that according to uh, many of the reports, there were hundreds and hundreds of millions worth of dollars at risk that could be exploited any time. But we did not really see that much exploitation in the world. Um, and obviously there were a few hacks here and there, but nothing really anywhere close to the, to the amounts claimed. And despite there's these couple of very big exploits, like we couldn't really find the numbers just didn't match much. So uh, in this paper, what we try to do is just to see exactly, not exactly, but at least roughly, like what is the actual exploitation on, on Ethereum? And so uh, at this point, so it, now it's a bit uh, getting a slightly old because this has been first preprinted in uh, 2019, early 2019, and we, we did update a bit the numbers since then. But at, at this point, like it did give us a fairly good idea of like how much actual exploitation was going on. And um, so to do this, first we um, contacted the authors of all these different tools. And um, so five of these uh, authors were kind enough to provide us with their data set and all the contracts uh, that they found uh, would be potentially vulnerable. And we found out that uh, at the time of the reports, that would have been in total roughly 3 million ETH at stake. So uh, that's, especially with the current price of ETH, uh, really quite a lot of money, uh, roughly like $6 billion. Mm. And so to... Um, try to see whether these contracts have actually been exploited or, or not at all. Uh, what we did is that we first uh, looked at all these contracts. We uh, fetch all the transactions that have possibly uh, touched these contracts directly or indirectly. Then we um, got all the execution traces, so which means that every single instruction that this contract has ever executed, we fetch this. And uh, we encoded all these instructions in some uh, more structured uh, data log database. And then we crafted some um, data log queries to try to find the different vulnerabilities that we mentioned uh, previously. So to give a brief idea of what this could look like, so for example, for the reinferency, which um, give, given the nature of Ethereum will always be some sort of uh, mutually recursive call. And what we did is simply check for all the call and check whether directly or indirectly there were any chance, for example, if A called B, uh, if contract A called contract B, that the contract B could possibly call back into contract A. Uh, and this is expressed fairly simply in data log. So this is a um, quite simplified version of what we actually use to detect this. Um, and we wrote like uh, this type of rules, all of other, I'll just brief, briefly introduce them. For unhandled exceptions, we first checked whether there was any call that actually failed. Uh, and if this call never influenced any uh, condition, any, so, any execution pass, well, then it would mean that uh, this uh, has not been checked properly and uh, this would result in this unhandled exception. Or for example, for integer overflow, we uh, first try to um, infer the, the actual type of um, the variable touched, given that the whole bytecode is completely untyped, uh, we, we need to use some sort of heuristic a bit to do this. For example, if there is a, something touching the sign, we can assume that it's signed integer and doesn't sign one. And then once we infer this type, we um, could uh, compare the type result and the untyped result and see if they were uh, consistent or not. And so using this approach, and uh, it's worth noting that we're checking for um, difference in ETH amounts here. We were not, uh, at, at that time, like the DeFi space was not like uh, yet established enough to check for all of the ERC and other uh, tokens, but at least in terms of ETH at stake, um, we saw that uh, a total of at most 0.27% uh, of the streaming at stake could have been exploited. 
And this was mostly through a reentrancy and uh, through integer overflows. And all the others were mostly all, all, almost unexploited whatsoever. And for integer overflow, we do assume that there might be uh, some a bit of overestimating going on here. So, um, so the main takeaway from this is that clearly, like reentrancy is by far uh, of the um, what we analyze the most dangerous um, vulnerability. And up to this day, there are still many contracts that keep getting exploited um, using this. While on the other hand, a couple of other uh, others were not uh, that problematic. For example, until exceptions and dependency on, dependency on uh, disrupted contract were not not that much of an issue. For the transition order dependency, and frankly, for this particular paper, we did not really look into front running and these sort of things, but just looked at um, stealing ease for this, which is not really a thing, but uh, there are now many other papers talking about about this front running parts, which are uh, a bit more problematic for uh, this sort of um, vulnerability. Um, and finally, we tried to look a bit into why uh, there was so little ease that was exploited given like the potential amount of stake. And the main outcome was that really like the ETH is so concentrated in so little, um, so few contracts that as long as these contracts are very secure, uh, there is fairly little chance that, that the lot will be at stake. And so, for example, we found that um, from what we analyzed, the top six contracts uh, held uh, roughly an 83% of the total ETH and only a total of like 10% um, of the contracts we analyzed even held some ETH, uh, which means that at the end of the day, the chances that these get exploited or are, are fairly small. Um, and finally, we found that many contracts were, were vulnerable, but not really exploitable. So for example, here we can see that uh, owners, um, if, if the number of owners grew too much, the contract would never be able to execute anymore, which is flagged by many static analysis tools. But because owners is only controlled by existing owner, there's little, very little chance for such a problem to actually happen. So in summary, yes, we analyzed all these contracts, found that a very little uh, portion of these could uh, potentially be at risk and would be exploited. And uh, that overall like high value contracts seem to be uh, very secure. So uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any question, uh, you can contact me, uh, find my contact info on the following URL. Thank you.